Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask the Trainer and sorry for the delay, we had some technical uh, difficulties in the background. Um, I see that uh, you noticed that and I'm also very happy for all the love that you sent me <laughs> to solve that problem. Thank you very much and thanks for being so patient. Um, yeah, today I am joined by Mr. Noseman and uh, we are going to talk about integrating uh, 3D um, elements into live action footage and especially camera tracking, but also a few other techniques. So what I want to share first is um, my screen. So let's hope it's on, here we go. And Mr. Sassy is in here, although he's not in here, so I'm gonna um, <laughs> talk a little. Right, cool. Let me take care of the housekeeping. So here we are on the Maxon events page and you can find that under news and events when you are on the Maxon website. And if you scroll down, you can see all the events that we are attending and there is a lot, and I really mean a lot of live streaming shows here. Um, we've got Ask the Trainer today, um, tomorrow we're gonna have VFX and chill, if I'm not mistaken. Um, or is there no session this week and just next week? We will find out. All right, but on Monday we will have another demystifying post-production um, series. Then next Thursday there is Max on Color and so on. So there's a lot of exciting stuff happening um, and it's all for free. And if you missed a session, Yes, thank you. Um, if you missed a session, you can always go to the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel 
And here you can find all the recordings of the sessions that we did and you can catch up. Right, then there is a site that I also want to share, which is the certification site. So if you go to learn and certification on the Maxon website, you will uh, come to this site. And the reason why I'm showing this is because we've got um, like, first of all, a free knowledge test um, that everyone can take for several of our uh, products. But then there's this Cinema 4D Pro user certification and the trainer certification. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there is a list of certification topics. Those are the topics that you should know, uh, that you should have mastered already. Um, and if you want to take um, the test, then um, I think you would be good if you mastered all of these already. And this list is quite extensive and we are picking um, topics from that list. And yeah, we yeah explain stuff so that you um, can prepare better for your certification if you want to um, if you want to take the test. And if you don't want to take the test, it's still valuable knowledge. Isn't that cool? All right. So uh, the last thing I want to share is the um, merch store. I didn't type in the password yet and I already uh, forgot what it was. <laughs> Isn't that great? So let me let me quickly double check here. So Darren, if you want to, Darren is in the in the chat, by the way, and answering your questions. So let me quickly get another window here and see what the password is. So here we go. The password is creative workflows, all capital and without a space. And if you type that in here and continue, you should get to this page. And here you can order a t-shirt and you will get one t-shirt for free. You will only have to pay for the shipping. And that's enough of the housekeeping for now. Now we want to start with motion tracking. All right, so first of all, what is motion tracking? Motion tracking is basically um, creating a connection between the live action footage and some 3D elements. And in the past, I created a few uh, shots that um, have motion tracking in there. Uh, for example, this one. This is a very simple one um, that I tracked inside of After Effects, actually. Um, to add those uh, canvases here, those uh, screens. Um, but then you can also go further and not just do like planar stuff, but you can also, um, yeah, let the let Cinema 4D recreate the scene using scene reconstruction, which is part of the Cinema 4D motion tracker. And then you can create like growth effects along trees, for example, or any object you want. Here is another shot. Um, why I thought it was funny if the cuckoos were coming out of the church tower and another one that was using scene reconstruction. Um, that was actually a pretty tricky one because the shape here was really organic, but I got it out of the scene reconstruction that is part of Cinema 4D, um, of the motion tracker, I mean, and yeah, then last but not least, here is one, um, combined tracking shot where it didn't just track the camera. All of the others just were tracking the camera. But in this one, um, I tracked the camera as well as the frame here. So the frame is real and I had some blue screen thing on it with markers. And then I replaced everything inside here with, uh, yeah, 3D elements and uh, simulation. And um, yeah, I think uh, it's always kind of cool to combine live action with um, 3D. And yeah, so let's uh, jump into Cinema 4D and then um, I can show you how motion tracking works. So the first thing I do usually, that's, that's the start uh, standard layout. So the first thing I usually do when I start tracking something, oh, um, I think it's still Thanasis' screen. Oh, my screen is missing. That's when you have to rush everything because of technical problems. Let me 
I can show something uh, while you're preparing. Yes, please. Yes, yeah, please. yeah. So uh, let's fill in the the time with something. So uh, I went on the uh, interwebs and I found this image. And um, what I'm going to show you now is called eyeballing the scene because I think in one of the previous seminars, uh, Darren and Dr. Sassy showed you how to uh, do uh, uh, camera calibration. But there are certain ways you can do this uh, manually. So I've got a background object, which you can find here in the scene objects, and I've created a uh, material that has an image I found. Um, and the only thing you need to do pretty much is go to your render settings just to, to make sure that everything is going to work. And you can read the resolution of your image here and just make sure your camera aspect ratio is uh, the same. Uh, you start with a, this resolution and then if you lock the ratio, you can make this go up and down and uh, do that fine stuff. So then you just drag your material on the background object. And this is now the background. Uh, one more thing, just for completeness, make sure the material viewport is set to no scaling. Uh, don't try and go to the higher resolution. If you put no scaling, it's going to present it the, the, exactly the way the image is. And what we're going to do here, I chose this image for a couple of reasons. Um, one of the main aspects besides orientation is uh, camera height and the horizon. Look at the horizon here. And basically, the horizon is a line if you project your the height of your eyes or the camera uh, straight ahead. That's where the horizon meets infinity. And because we know that humans uh, are between five and six feet, between uh, one meter 65 to one meter 82, for example, we can get an average of where people's heads are. And we should put our horizon at that height and it will even give us the tilt of the camera for this particular case so i'm going to go and look uh, through the camera here and i'm going to bring my horizon down so it's pretty much where people's heads is and if i feel that we need to do a tilt or something like that i can just uh, tilt find which one of these i need to change it's always the third one that's what you need to remember the last one you think is correct and you can go incrementally here and start changing uh, the uh, angle of this camera to find that, you know, fine tune it. So it's pretty much on the average of the standing uh, people or something like that. And you don't need to be extremely, uh, um, extremely accurate with this. And um, basically, th th you may not be able to know exactly the camera lens that was used, uh, but you can just eyeball this. Uh, by creating something uh, of known size, for example, like a building, and then start moving the camera so that that looks uh, pretty much uh, aligned with this. Um, uh, let's uh, create a, uh, a very t uh, a cube here. Let's uh, put it um, 100 so it's on the floor. And I'm going to do everything, everything, just by eyeballing. And I'm going to move this fairly to the, the back. Uh, let me go to my top view and close this so we get a bit more real estate. Move this back, move this back, move this back and move far enough. So and don't forget a building is not two meters tall, right? Uh, so I'm not going to do this in, in uh, scale. Um, just by this will allow you to see the perspective. Um, let me turn this off. So the lines we're looking at to uh, figure out the perspective are these lines over here, these ones over here. So for this, maybe a plane, if you lift it uh, up and we'll face it on the X and add some uh, subdivisions and turn on your lines, um, maybe do this. Um, what you could do is if you want to see the image through this, you just drag your image on the plane and you do a frontal projection. Make sure it's a frontal projection. And based on the uh, the line, if they align with uh, another known line, like these little things, you can start changing your camera's focal length until the perspective seems quite similar. And you push it a bit. 
but the idea is to get these lines to uh, to uh, align with something you know is straight, which are in this case is these windows. And uh, yeah, the the camera angle will be another thing you need uh, to uh, uh, sort of play with. So maybe this is uh, looking down um, a bit. And now we got that line over there. And this way, for a scene like this, uh, this sort of eyeballing uh, is going to work for you. As you can see, both the horizontal and the vertical lines align pretty well with the building. So if I were to drop an object in here now, um, I could make it seem that it's part of the scene. So find something of known height. Uh, Darren gave me a very good idea. It could be a door. Uh, most uh, standard doors have uh, a height of maybe two to two meters twenty. That will be something something in uh, imperial, um, and um, the perspective drives your uh, your camera lens, your focal length, how um, much the lines tend to go, how fast they they start going towards the vanishing points the horizon, and then just the, the rotation. And if you identify something that's straight, for example, we can see some sort of faint line here. Uh, you may be able to go and... Uh, my mother is calling from Greece. Sorry about that. Um, and you can align the camera. For a scene like this, that's not uh, absolutely necessary. You can get away with something like this. So... Uh, that's what I have to say about the eyeballing. Depending on the scene you have, you may not need to use the camera calibrator. All you need to remember is that you need the horizon, which will uh, show you which way the camera is. Is it looking downwards? Is it looking upwards? And then what is the focal length of your camera? Everything else is pretty much arbitrary. So uh, with that done, are you ready, Jonas, to show your stuffs? I've got more stuff. I am, yeah. Uh, so... Um... One thing I want to add here is that um, if you really want to get the horizon line exactly, then um, one way to get it would be to to follow the vanishing lines um, where they are, uh, where they turn into the vanishing point. And once you connect the two vanishing points, the one on the left and the one on the right, that should be the uh, the horizon. If the there. problem with that is that sometimes your vanishing points are outside your frame. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And in, in our specific case, we don't have the capability of doing that because we are confined to the camera canvas. That's why, uh, although you could do it under certain circumstances, if you had a, a, a view uh, where the object was, uh, you were looking from, let's say, a very shallow angle towards an object and you could see the vanishing point, like that if you're looking down a road in the desert, that then precisely you can do that because where the road disappears, so to speak, becomes a dot. That's where your horizon is. Uh, but for most photos, just finding something you can estimate the height is uh, enough to, to do that. And always remember that uh, if you're using proper coordinates, <clears throat> here, obviously, the camera is looking, uh, I would say, down or from the same level, someone shot it from uh, eye level. So you should put the height to something like 180 and then just adjust uh, the tilt to bring the horizon where it needs uh, to be. So just by knowing approximately how high the camera was from the floor, knowing uh, approximately uh, trying to figure out the perspective by changing your uh, camera uh, focal length and uh, the smaller the focal length the faster things are going to become a, a, a single point right and uh, the more zoom the lens the more parallel things happening if you put if you make zoom infinite for example uh, then all the lines uh, become parallel so uh, by using uh, the, the, the this knowledge then you're able to estimate uh, just visually if uh, uh, if you want to put objects in a scene like this, uh, the position of the camera uh, in relation to this and just get good perspective for various objects you're going to use. Yay. That's cool. All right. So um, let me switch to my screen. That should work now. Yeah. And um, I want to show you how you can um, motion track, like how you can 
solve the camera from filmed footage. And it, actually, it, that's a pretty fast process. If you just run through it, it's uh, it's totally fine. I want to share some knowledge along the way. Maybe um, the first um, run will be a little bit faster because I just want to show you how, how fast um, the process is. First of all, what I usually do, I switch from standard to the track layout. And then we have the track view active here. And if there's no footage in there and no motion tracker in the scene, it asks you to double click to create a motion tracker object. You could also get this from here. And then it's um, asking you to double click to select some footage. And I already have the right one here. So I'm using an image sequence and I would always um, recommend you to use image sequences for the tracking process um, instead of footage or of video footage because uh, Cinema 4D will have an easier time with that. Sometimes it can be that you will get or that you will run into arrows when you um, try to track uh, footage that is not exactly like 25 frames per second or 30 frames per second and so on. So um, let's open this up and I've got this footage now here. It's um, yeah. It's like a parking garage thing. And here in the motion tracker, we have several tabs and they are ordered, they are in chronological order. So it starts with the footage. So first of all, we need to set up our footage. Um, this is where we um, type in where the footage is, where we get the footage from. And then we can resample this. For example, if we have like huge, um, uh, footage like 8k or so we can sample it down in this case it's full hd so i usually go with something between 50 and 100 percent in this case i'm going to go with 100 percent because then i will have all of the detail in here and let me scrub through the timeline so this is the, the shot here and the next thing that happens usually is that we track it we run a 3d tracking pass on it and after that, the 3D solve. So the important thing now is to understand that this is a 2D tracking pass. So right now, Cinema 4D is just seeing a grid of pixels that are coming with different color. Um, it doesn't know anything about the depth of this um, footage here. So that's important to understand also because a tracker is not just like finding some features. <laughs> Um, like um, a corner, for example, of an object and then try to track it. No, it's trying to find a feature that is on, um, on a surface, um, ideally, because then it won't change as much over time. Um, however, um, the process, as I said, is really fast because right now here, if you go with automatic tracking, you can simply hit the auto track button and then um, some stuff will happen in the background. You can see that down here, um, it's doing the 2D tracking pass, it's tracking forward and backward. And then after a few seconds, it will return the 2D trackers. And yeah, as I said, it's, it's trying to find patterns, like for example, this, um, this um, text here on the door and trying to follow it. And the less this pattern changes over time, the better it is. But of course, that's not always the case. So let's have a look here. So these are our two dimensional trackers. And the next step would be based on the parallax that we have in here uh, from one tracker to another. Um, Cinema 4D can now calculate the camera out of it. But first, let's have a look at those filters because you can see that we actually um, created 300 tracks and the minimum spacing here is 19 pixels. Um, but what we can see here is far less than 300 tracks. So the first thing I want to show is these filters here. Let's switch them off. So if I scrub the timeline, you can see that there is a lot of jittering in there, which wasn't the case before. And that is because the smart acceleration um, is on by default. And what this is doing is it's comparing the directions of, of the trackers and also the speeds um, of the surrounding um, trackers. And if they are, let's say, completely unrealistic, completely different compared to the surrounding ones, 
it will filter them out, right? And that's why we get a very stable thing here. The other one that is really important is minimum tracker length. Uh, that's why it's enabled by default. So sometimes um, trackers are just there for five frames or so. They might be stable, but they are just there for five frames. And that's why they are not as valuable as a, um, a tracker that is in the in the scene for a longer time. And uh, you can see that here, for example, this is one of these trackers that has been filtered out. And then there are two other methods of filtering. And one is the maximum acceleration. I mean, that's clear. If there's suddenly a jump of one tracker, for example, uh, from this side to this side, that's way too fast and it would just be filtered out. Um, usually smart acceleration is um, is covering that as well. And then there is the error threshold, and this has to do with the pattern um, that is being tracked itself. So, right. Um, let me, yeah, let me have a look at the graph view as well. This is the graph view, and here you can see all of the, all of the trackers that are in there. And you can see it's a lot. So there's an entry aligned for each and every tracker in the scene. Not all of them are shown here. Some of them are filtered out, but they are still there. And you can see that there are some that are red and others that are green. Of course, green is good and red is not so good. Um, but what does that actually mean? So the, it's the, the arrow um, that we have in here. So based on the, so first of all, when a tracker has been created, it will um, capture that pattern that it is following. And over time, of course, this changes because of noise, because of uh, shifts in perspective, because of motion blur, stuff like that, um, or of uh, rotation. All of these, uh, all of this can be reasons uh, for um, the pattern not being as accurate as before. And this is what um, uh, you can see here. So another thing that you can see when you go to this view is um, like a bunch of, of um, arrows here. So this is, again, a line for each and every um, tracker. And here we see the arrow that, uh, the arrow that, has, that is in the pattern. Right, and it's pretty high because one, this line here is the maximum. So if we want to bring that down, we can always uh, activate the error threshold and just bring it down to let's say 50% and this will filter out a few other trackers as well. We can also uh, move this line here in the tracker view, which is quite cool. And then for troubleshooting, sometimes it is also cool to have a look at, um, at these two here. So this one, is the tracking speed. Sometimes um, when you have um, footage with an arrow, for example, with, an, with a double frame, you will see that the speed will go down to zero for all um, trackers at one frame. This is something you can find out pretty well in here. And then there's also the same for um, acceleration. So this can be used for troubleshooting. It's worth uh, checking the documentation on that because um, th these uh, graphs here can help you really well. All right, so let's bring that away and close it. And then we're gonna go to the next step. So you don't have to do all of the stuff that I did in here. You can just go on um, with a 3D solve. And in here, it's as simple as hitting the run 3D solver button unless you know the focal length, for example, then you can um, set it to known and ca uh, constant. Um, in this case, it's unknown but constant, um, but Cinema 4D usually does a pretty good job in assuming the focal length. So I run the 3D solver and you can see it down here again that something is happening. And once it's finished, so now it's, the, it's doing the parallax comparison and um, based on the parallax, it will find out the, the actual camera perspective. And now you can see that something is happening. When I scrub the timeline, you can see those little nulls here. Um, if you wanna see them, including the grid and everything, um, it is always helpful to leave 2D track mode. That's this button here. So if you leave it, you can see all of the, of the nulls here and you can already have a look 
at um, from the side and here you can see well that's looking kind of good this is supposed to be the ground so somehow we need to align the scene and this can be done by using constraints so with the motion tracker selected that's important you can find the constraints menu down here the first thing i usually add is a position constraint and with the pos uh, position constraint you can define um, a point in 3d space usually you would define the scene origin and let's say i want this to be um i want yeah i want this to be the scene origin i just click it and now you can see that the constraint has been created it has linked this null in it and this is the position um, that we are assigning to it right so the next thing i usually want to do is um, define either the ground plane or one of the axes so let's start with one of the axes we can do that by using the vector constraint and uh, the vector constraint needs two uh, nulls here as an input so let's uh, maybe use two on this line here let's go with maybe this one and this one and then we say that this is x and now you can see that um, the whole grid here has been aligned to that and um, another thing that we can do here that is quite useful is we can define the length of this so what we can do now is we can set this length to known and then let's say this is maybe i'd say it's one meter 50 or 150 centimeters something like that and now that's looking already quite nice another thing we can do because we just defined this axis we can define the ground plane and that's what we need the planar constraint for with a plane, uh, planar constraint, we can also define walls and so on. But um, most of the time, I use it to define the ground plane. And defining the ground plane is something I usually would do in the area of interest. So if I would add some object right here, I would um, add the ground plane here. So the ground plane constraint or the planar constraint needs a minimum of three um, inputs here. And there we go. I mean, that's, that's already it. And what we can do now is, for example, grab a car from the asset browser. Uh, let's go with this guy. And there we go. Oh, maybe I misassumed the length of this constraint here. So let's make it two meters instead. That's That looks about right. And now we can just, yeah, park it here or there wherever we want so let's see let me go with the main controller here and let's place it maybe here and let's also adjust this to be geometry only and well Let's move it to the front again a little bit more using the master controller, something like that. And then go with geometry only. And now if we scrub the timeline here, you can see that the car is sitting in there in a pretty solid way, right? So that's basically the process of how you would track something it's it's really fast as i as i told you it's um you don't have to take care of all of the filtering uh, because the uh, the defaults are actually really good i most of the time add some um error uh, error threshold and set it to 20 or so depending on how many um how many trackers i have because at some point when you have not enough trackers um it will stop um, solving the scene all right cool um, so that's the first one that I wanted to show. And um, let me go on with something that is a little bit, um, well, a little bit more advanced. So what we have here, um, well, right now we don't have anything. So let's go and create a motion tracker and select the footage. And in this case, I want to use the balcony footage that I shot. Here we go. Let's go to the footage tab and bring the sampling to 
And now let's scrub the timeline. So this is um, the balcony. So this is actually what I see when I have a look right there. It's nice, isn't it? So, right. You're sharing, you're sharing my screen instead of your screen. I do. Which is not a problem because I've made something I'm going to show later on how I put this cup on this scene. But Wait. you can continue. I'm sharing your screen. I hacked your, your screen. Why did you do that? Except I my screen did is it on. without even thinking about it. It just happened. It just happened. Somehow it lost it. Okay, why is that? Let me fix <laughs> it. Let me fix it. Today is uh, the day of, of uh, technical challenges. And we are right here. Which I had no part. It. I had no part in them. So I have an idea why it happened. Just wondering why it never happened before. All right. I think now you can see my screen again. So this is the balcony of the Maxon headquarters. One of them. <laughs> and um, yeah, this is the view if you want to see it again. Right. So. Um, what we have here is something that is a little bit more challenging and you can see that best in this shot or in this frame because what we have here is a curved line. Actually, this thing is supposed to be straight and that's one of the things that is important to understand that motion trackers um, work best when they are, uh, when, when you are feeding them with footage that is undistorted. And so there are two ways, actually, how you can undistort um, stuff. One is the way inside of Cinema 4D, um, where you can create a lens profile, um, save it on your drive, and then use it for everything else that you shoot with that lens, for example. And um, the thing is that this only works with um, standard renderer and physical. And then there is another way where you undistort the footage in After Effects already, for example, using lens distortion matter from uh, VFX Suite, and then use the undistorted footage inside of Cinema 4D, um, render everything out, for example, using Redshift, and then um, yeah, bring it back and distort it in comp. Um, but let me show you this way first. So this is the problem, as I told you. Um, we've got a curved line here. and we need to create a lens profile. So let me create a new scene first. And here I'm gonna go to the standard layout and it lost the screen again. Let me go here. Ah, all right, that's it. Okay. Then let me fix it in another way. Let me go to render and lens distortion. That's what we need. And this tool allows you to um, create or to feed it with the footage. And I'm going to use the last frame here, this one, open it up. And now we have this footage. And in the lens distortion tab, we can create endpoint lines and we can see them here. And what we need to do is, oh, what happened? It's a very challenging day today. So, oh, that is, that is interesting. So maybe I should do it the other way. Let me just use another scene, which is now working. Interesting. So I'm going to show, uh, Jonas, I'm going to show one distortion in After Effects using Ren Giant uh, lens distortion. If uh, you still have uh, problems, just pass it on to me and I can show that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try it one more time. Yes, please. So here we go. Last frame open. Here we go. And I go to lens distortion and add an endpoint line. And now I can grab it and you can see this line and this line um, needs to follow one of these distorted lines. So we can place it here. We've got the magnifying glass to make it even more accurate. And then if we need more subdivision here, we can simply control click onto the line to create a new point. Let's 
create one in the middle here and then create one here and and so on right so we're doing this with one line and then we are creating um, another one and place that for example down here and another thing you can do whenever you have a new lens for example you can um, shoot some sort of um, paper that has a grid printed on it and then you can use that grid to undistort your stuff but it happens pretty often that you shoot something without really knowing that you're going to use it for motion tracking later and then you might have to do it the way I'm doing it right now that you create the lens profile out of um, out of nowhere out of uh, some straight lines that are hopefully in your footage so here we go now I followed them and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select a lens distortion model um, let me go with this one and try if that works, auto solve. I think that doesn't look right. I think we're pretty fish IE here. So let's solve it with this one. And um, that's working really well. So now those lines are straight and we can save this as a lens profile. So let me go up here and save this as our balcony lens profile. Hit save. And now what we have is a file let me find it here. There we go. Is a file that is called Balcony LNS. That's the lens profile. And the important thing about that is that we can use it um, in the motion tracker, for example. So let me go back to this scene and let's hope that I don't miss uh, that the screen is not missing but it seems to be good all right here is the motion tracker I already fed it with the footage and here is the input for the lens profile so let me just use the balcony LNS that I just created hit open and now everything is undistorted and we can scrub through the timeline here and it works and now let's do the same magic again just go to the 2d tracking um, auto track the thing and yeah, once we did that, I'm going to just add um, an object here and then tell you or show you how you can use it, uh, how, how you can use the inverse uh, distortion to render with uh, distortion um, included so that you have it a little bit easier in compositing. So here we are. So one thing that you should never do, I just do that because of uh, time restrictions here. You should never ever track reflections. You should also um, never track stuff that is behind a glass because the glass usually isn't 100% planar and um, sometimes yeah there, there are some it can cause some distortion which would confuse the tracker in this case uh, it works but usually I would definitely recommend uh, masking these things out before you start tracking. Masking, by the way, is in here. So with that tool here, you can create masks um, that you can use to exclude um, parts of the uh, video or of the image sequence um, from the tracking or to include it. Right, so next step is the 3D solve. Let me run the 3D solver. And in a few seconds, we will have what we want. So Nozman, you're going to show the the After Effects way with lens distortion matcher? Yeah, yeah. And uh, right. in the process, I'm going to answer <clears throat> a question from Anders uh, as well. That's good. It, it, it aligns with what I'm going to show. Uh, yeah, Anders asked the question. So you use two horizontal lines and one vertical line. Actually, it it doesn't matter um, um, how they are aligned. If it, they can also be diagonal. It's always good to to follow the the strongest lines that you have in there because it would make your life easier. And I'm going to I'm going to show that. Yeah. yeah. 
And also one rule of thumb is um, it is better to have less lines that are more accurate than um, too many lines that are less accurate. So I think w with three lines, I, um, I pretty much had um, a good experience every time. So let's go to the track layout and leave 2D mode here. And again, now let's create a position constraint somewhere here. Then let's create the vector constraint. And I think, let me scrub here a little bit to see what we're actually doing. So this one is good. And this one maybe for the X and this could be a length of around, let me just watch up, uh, have a look outside the window. I would say three meters. So here we go. And then we just need to define the ground plane and we can do that using the planar constraint. And let's use this one, this one, and maybe this one. So this is looking pretty good. We can work with that. And now the object that I'm going to, um, to add here is just a simple cylinder for the sake of time, or saving time. And I'm going to make it pretty thin, let's say 20. And uh, the height is going to be four meters and the coordinates something like this. Let me move it to the side a little bit. And now you can see that it's in there. So this could be some sort of chimney or whatever. Right. But now the problem is when I render this, so let me just open up the render settings and we are in standard here. This works with standard and physical. It does not work with Redshift. Um, when I render this, and also let me go into the motion tracker, into the footage tab and create a background object. Right, so now I render and you can see that we have the distorted footage. You can see that on these lines, for example, but you can see that this guy here is straight, uh, but it needs to be distorted to fit into the image. And this is where you can add an effect that is also called lens distortion. And you can feed that also with the balcony uh, lens profile. I just have that on my other screen. And now if we render, you can see that this guy is following the same uh, curvature as the others. So here's the comparison. So it's not too extreme, but you can see it down here at the contact point that it makes a huge difference. And if you have like someone, a 3D character standing here, for example, and with that uh, camera movement, you would definitely um, experience that in one version, this character might be floating um, across the floor and in the version with lens distortion um, applied, um, it won't because it's matching. All right, so that's what I wanted to show. And now because we are already pretty tight on time, <laughs> I'm gonna hand over to Noseman. Hey, hello everyone. Take it away. So, yeah, I've got um, a couple of hours of material to show, but I'm just gonna show some, uh, um, you know, the interesting and condensed stuff to uh, address some of the concerns. So this was footage I shot at our local playground uh, with a GoPro last year. The weather is much better oh, now. Can I, can oh, I with... go back to two questions that I uh, saw in the in the chat? So uh, Yin and Tal asked, how do I know that I should define the planar constraint on the y-axis and not on the z-axis, for example? So when you think of a plane, um, the axis that is um, shown there um, is the axis that is pointing up. So whenever you want to have um, a ground plane, you use Y. Whenever you have a wall, it can be X or it can be Z or Z. Um, so that's the answer here. And then there was a, another question. Is there a certain reason for choosing the position constraint on a certain point in the footage? And Yes, yes, the answer is yes. yes. The answer is clearly yes. Um, you define the scene origin using that constraint, and this can be really important. Um, it's As I'm showing in my screen, the height of the camera 
without a position constraint is always on the ground plane. So by putting a, a, a position constraint, you're actually giving the tracker reference as to how high, how high the camera is. Because as far as the synthetic image, the, the tracker doesn't know if the floor is there, if the floor is here, if the floor is on the book, or if the floor is on the uh, laptop. And that is something we define in order to have our scene more closely aligned. So um, the overall thing is, at minimum, if you want to have uh, a good solve and good control, a, um, a vector constraint to define a distance that will give you scale, a planar constraint to define uh, a plane, predominantly the, the, the ground or a wall, to define that, and a point constraint to define your scene origin so that you know how to navigate your scene when you're in the 3D world. So these, you don't have to do any of those. Because we could be in the space station and up could be that way in this particular case. So up and down are just arbitrary notions which just help us uh, align our scenes properly. Did that answer the question? I think of so. Course, yeah, of course it did. I was just pretending. So what I was uh, going to show here in After Effects is this is a simple GoPro. Now, in terms of um, uh, lens profiles, um, the lens profile is per lens with a fixed focal length. If you have a zoom lens and you play with the zoom, each zoom level has a different uh, distortion profile. So that is a totally different considerations. consideration. What we're going to talk about is fixed focal length um, uh, lenses here. So the, um, once you create a good lens profile, then that lens profile can be used for any footage you've shot with the same camera. That's it. You do it once for a particular lens. I said camera, meaning lens. So you don't have to do this for your footage. Now, what I'm doing here, and I purposely went very close to this green pole, because here you can see the extreme uh, barrel distortion, because um, the GoPro, uh, the one I stole from Nick Haraz, um, it has a fisheye lens. And um, the alternative way, uh, by using one of Maxon's tools, instead of doing it in Cinema 4D, if you wish, uh, if you're going to do your composite in, in post, is to use the lens, the lens distortion matcher. And you just drag this bugger on here, and you do exactly what Jonas did uh, earlier. You go, you, you find an extreme, so if you're here, we don't have a lot of bending. So it's going to be harder and you have less uh, control and detail. But if you come closer, and again, you can do this in your office, print a grid, uh, a square grid, uh, go and shoot it so it's um, from frame to frame, and that will uh, give you a very good uh, distortion. So in this particular case, all you have to do is go very roughly, and I do not care if this is not going to be correct. It says switch to fisheye lens. Yes, I was planning to do that. Thank you very much. There you go. You press escape. You do another one here. And I'm trying to do it as fast as possible to show you that uh, as far as the accuracy, I'm pressing escape again. And of course, you can zoom in if you wish to do so. After Effects yesterday was crashing. I did an update and it's not crashing. So the reason I said that is to bring the jinx. Whenever you say that, the computer crashes. And I always need one more reason to complain because I don't complain enough, apparently. So uh, remove distortion. There you go. There's our footage. Look at that. So we didn't catch everything. We didn't, we, we didn't go to the side. But this is predominantly going to be ignored by the tracker. And this is the, the footage... Uh, that's been undistorted. You export this as a PNG and uh, you track it. And then you render everything as you want without any distortion. And then you go and you reapply this by copying and pasting the same lens distortion and inverting the distortion. So that's the, the uh, process. And I think I have this. Uh, here is, I don't want to save that. This is one thing I did exactly using this method. 
And here is the redistorted version of that. Look at that. And I've redistorted everything. What you're seeing here is undistortion using After Effects. Um, one of the mannequins where I just uh, looped the animation from our motion tracking library from the asset manager, uh, the office, because everyone wants an office in the playground. And then I just had two uh, AOVs for the shadow and the environment and whatnot and an alpha channel. And I just composited uh, this and reapplied. If you go here, you will see that I've reapplied this using inverse. So this would be uh, uninverted and this is be, uh, will be the inverted distortion. There's actually an, uh, an easier way to do that. Good. So um, you have this, you have this uh, big blue button there, create undistortion pre-comp. Yep. And yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't do that. I want to do things and know what they do. I don't like cryptic things. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. It creates yeah. a pre-comp and applies it and all that yeah, kind just, of stuff. Just to, just to ex explain it, maybe, uh, maybe you can click it um, so that everyone sees what, uh, what it is creating. So I'm going to click it. I click it. it. Okay. And now if you go inside of that undistorted uh, work comp, you can see that in here you have, are you in there already? Is That's why I don't do things. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, here we go. Here I, we go. So what I'm trying to say here to, to just uh, to, to make it seem that I'm smarter is that I had never touched the lens distortion uh, matcher up until late yesterday when I was telling everyone that I've got my presentation ready and uh, <laughs> by passing a few uh, crashes, which uh, have, they're, they're not happening. So I'm very happy. I actually um, just did that. What I showed you with the two lines, it worked. Then I tracked it automatically in Cinema 4D. I didn't add any manual trackers and it worked. Then I did some compositing and everything worked. And I rendered this and uh, got the, the final image. So yeah. this, is, uh, this was done by a uh, lens distortion uh, matcher novice like myself. So that means that anyone can do that. Of okay. course, I'm so least... let me show you what, what's cool about this comp. Everything you add in this comp, you can see that this layer that is in there, that's just the guide layer, so it won't render. Mm -hmm. um, so everything that you put into that comp will be distorted and yeah, be distorted then on the on the nice. main footage. And that's a really cool workflow helper. So when you just create a rectangle here, for example, let's create a rectangle. So new shape layer and is that what you want me to do and yes. do that yes. good so no not in this layer here we go it, it's other. okay it's okay it, it works and then go to the other comp oh and put the same thing in that comp no just go to the other comp with the, the... that was a distorted one though all oh, right there you go there we go I did the wrong one, yeah. But anyhow, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's very, very simple. That's a pretty uh, cool thing here. You need to understand the, the principles are the following. Number one, all lenses have distortion unless it's got a focal length of zero, which it doesn't exist. Uh, number two, each fixed uh, lens has this, the same profile. It doesn't change with what you're shooting. You have to do it once. First, you undistort your footage, which means you're going to lose parts of your image because your, your, your image needs to be uh, compressed uh, uh, so that you don't get those black sort of weird borders because it does some sort of uh, pinching. So you are going to lose. If you're going to shoot for uh, distortion, try to have uh, shoot at a higher resolution, maybe if you can figure out the uh, the focal lengths and your your um, sensors and uh, the crop sensors and all that kind of stuff. Undistort, track, then render undistorted and bring it in your comp and redistort over the uh, original footage or something like that. Uh, just take into account that the resolutions are going to be slightly uh, different for the rendering because it does that uh, cropping. Anyhow. Any other comments so I can move quickly, although we've passed our time, but I do really want to show the, the other stuff because it's... Uh, we if... were late, so you're free to to show the stuff. Oh, we're late, so we can take it easy so, and hang out we here. We started late, you know, it's... Um...
Oh, why are we not late? <clears throat> so <laughs> let's uh, so let's do this. This was um, part of a on a ongoing project, and uh, let me go. So this is the final Cinema 4D thing I did, and let me find where do I have it somewhere here? No. Nope. So let me close this and let me uh, keep that open just in case. Bye bye eyeballing. And bye bye for this as well. So very quickly, let's create a new document. As uh, you know, showed, go to the track, double click here, and uh, let's go and load uh, that scene, the computer in room text. I say save this as PNGs. Oh, the other thing you need to remember when you're comping: if your camera was shooting twenty nine point nine five and you are rendering at 30, which is the correct way, just make sure that you do that thing in After Effects where you say uh, interpret footage and set your uh, rendering, uh, go set your, your rendering, right click, interpret footage, main, set that to your footage or set the footage to 30. Otherwise, you're going to have a mismatch. And although 29.97 and 30 shouldn't have any... Uh, uh, frame differences. Uh, I think there's one frame every 30 seconds. It's extremely small, uh, and yet they don't match. So make sure that your frame rate is the same for the render. And uh, even if you render at 30, this is rendered at 30, and the footage is 29.97. And if I set my render at 29.97, it aligns uh, properly. So that's another thing that catches many people and think that there's some sort of problem. So I'm loading this footage here. Number one. Set the sampling to 100%. There's no reason not to do that. We're going to do a full manual tracking. So once you set this to uh, the tracking mode, then your navigation tools uh, become uh, not the standard navigation tools. Uh, you can actually zoom in without uh, changing the, the um, uh, uh, distortion. So but for this particular scene, I'm going to um, track forwards and I'm going to track from frame zero. If you're doing a full manual track, either for a camera or for an object, you need at least seven trackers, right? Just remember that seven is something about the algorithm. It needs at least seven. And it doesn't matter if they're blurry. Uh, this is going to be some sort of feature that um, the, the algorithm recognizes as an image, makes an imprint and tries to follow it. So I'm pressing control or command a command if you're a Mac, click here. And this is the thing we're going to do. This is an RGB image. I'm going to find uh, by definition, what happens is that if you go to the options, uh, the tracker itself is looking for uh, illuminance. If I set this to track of you, now we're seeing what the tracker is seeing. But there's a mode here that was added very conveniently. Uh, the color filter now is luminance. But sometimes the detail is, let's say, in the uh, blue channel. And I use the three enhanced channels. I just go through them. And it appears that the best contrast we get is in the enhanced blue. And this is what the tracker sees. And the, the great thing ab about this, which now is not moving this, and it's making me a bit angry. Let's do this again. <clears throat> I hate it when it happens. So objects, motion tracker. I've got this. And uh, let's go to this tracker here. I've lost my tracker. So let's do it again. Control. Control. Um, I think you have to go back to 2D track mode. Yeah, I was in object mode. Yeah. So that was to see if you were paying attention. So control click. Um, set this to enhanced blue. And let's go and make this. Yeah, it's uh, giving me a hard time here. It's navigating, although I'm here. Go back here. There we go. See, just make sure that the little window here, which recognizes this tile, um, encompasses whatever your feature is, right? And again, imagine this feature, this black and white image, as some sort of barcode, which has a specific um, visual identity. And uh, the tracker makes a copy of this in memory and compares it for every frame. So I'm going to go and add a few of these and various parts of my keyboard, just setting them to enhance blue for the keyboard because I know uh, and the outer one is the search uh, area. And I'm going to add a few of these. There we go. 
search area the the faster the camera motion the larger you need to have the the search area enhance blue let's uh, continue here because i need at least seven let's go to the other side so we generate a bit more uh, parallax enhanced blue in this case as well excellent just place it somewhere where you know where it is uh, let's go and get this one. Let's make it bigger, bigger, and enhanced blue. And the good one with uh, the good thing with this shot is actually that you're not um, having a lot of changes in perspective, right? It's more like a it's a handheld yes. shot, isn't it? And then uh, um, yeah, it's handheld. It has a, a shake, uh, yeah. but the perspective doesn't change a lot. Now, I want to get two features where I can use to align what I'm doing. So I'm going to grab one over here, set this to enhance blue again. This little, so if I zoom in here, I'm, I'm grabbing this, you know, this is a, the identifiable feature over there. And then I'm going to grab this. Now, although this is a specular, because of the narrow movement of the camera, it doesn't affect it that much. So, and if you feel that the contrast is in the luminance or something like that, uh, do it so for every area of your image, you may find that a different um, a, a different uh, color filter uh, is going to give you the best uh, result. But for as far as the computer is concerned, and although the difference is not much, uh, this seemed to, to work for my case. And I've measured this on my own Mac, and it's 20 centimeters precisely. That's why I'm using it. Then I'm going to grab maybe something here. Uh, this, I think, was green. No. I think uh, red. Yeah, we get this. Uh, you can add a few more, although you don't need to. That's the, the great thing about this. Um, and let's go and grab something on the book, just in case you want to do something with, with the, the, the book. Let's go to this. Um, let's set this to enhanced green or enhanced uh, blue. No, it's always the third one, enhanced uh, red. So what you're just doing is actually something uh, really important, um, especially with the screen. You added a third dimension to the trackers, right? And that's, yes, uh, that's always something honest, that is helpful um, compared could, to, to just uh, tracking features case, on one thing. Yeah, in this particular case, it may not make a difference. But because in my original uh, project, I used this book to obscure something, and I wanted to find out where this surface was, I added a few. And since then, I've been doing it habitually. Mm -hmm. So there are cases when you do, where you don't require uh, to, to do these things. And uh, how many we have? I think we have nine. And let's see what this does, all right? It may or may not work. So once you've set your seven plus uh, tracks, never do anything when an object is moving, as you will see this was moving. So let's go 3D solve and run the solver. It's only 93 frames, and uh, it shouldn't take that uh, long to track. 2D tracking. Oh, yeah. What I forgot to do duh, is now I need to select them all and do the 2D tracking. So I set my uh, my feature uh, points. Now I track them. Now it's going to do, it's going to load all the images in memory. Then it's going to track where each and every one of these leaves uh, moves. And then based on the algorithm that says that it, they may appear to be moving, but they're all in the same uh, distance always. And uh, now I have these tracks. If you want to see if your tracks are good, you select one, you can zoom in and you can lock it. So you lock the view and you just see how that particular point, you can see how it's uh, fidgeting left and right. So this is not going to be a very good point, but I'm going to use it anyway because it's very forgiving. So the, the same with this. The other way it, you could use is yep. uh, instead of locking the, the view here, um, mm -hmm. you can use the, the track view, which is yes, so uh, the other view. tab next to the object tab. Uh, the, this will here. always show you exactly that. So... And uh, the sta the more stable the feature is with that within the borders, uh, you know that this is a good uh, a good track. Whereas if I select this one, you will see that it's sort of swimming around. Yeah, because there's a motion blur. But nonetheless, it's not that bad. I could do some corrections, but I won't bother with that. Now that everything has been uh, tracked, I can go to the 3D Solver and say run 3D Solver, and it's uh, transforming the the data. So. Here's our track, and let's go and see what it did in here. 
open up your objects, go to the camera, and you can see that this is the recorded camera motion. This is Seth's hand movement when he's holding the camera. Was it Seth that shot this? I think so. Now, let's go and do some um, constraints because these are going to be the important ones. And then I'm going to show you how to manually tweak this because you can't always uh, get things working with uh, constraints. So many ways of doing it. Uh, right click, uh, tracker. I'm going to add a uh, planar constraint. Now, you can always go and drag these over here. But another thing you could do is go to uh, object mode and select using your lasso, select the nulls. I'm going to select the nulls that I, well, I'm, I know are on the same plane. These are all the surface of the laptop, OK? You go here and you just drag them in here. And this is going to give you a plane that, in theory, is aligned. It's like a piece of paper on the computer. So there you go. Y or minus Y, I don't care in this particular case. But now you will see that our camera is aligned in relation to what it's seeing here. Now let's go and do the distance because this is going to change the scale. I'm going to leave these open so you can see the, the scale. So I'm going to go and right click here and add a vector constraint. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go to my features. I'm going to select this one and this one. Well, I have to deselect the tag for that to work. Select these two, select the tag and drop them in here. Uh, so it's one and the other one. So let me do that one by one. I can go here and say, OK, uh, take this and and move it uh, here. And it sort of snaps. It doesn't seem like it, but it does snap to the closest one. And this defines my X because that's what I want. Immediately, the camera moves. And as far as I measured it, it's exactly 25 centimeters. So now that the scale of my scene has changed, so the nulls are closer to this. And uh, what I did just to put the position where I wanted to um, is I went and I added my position uh, constraint, my position constraint, and I just put it on the same one. You can use the same one. There you go. So now the center of my, my the, the, the top of my computer lies on the uh, X, uh, Z plane. Now you can see that we have our floor is totally out of whack. It doesn't seem to be uh, correct. So at this point, we are going to manually uh, move our camera around. But you can't do it through the motion tracker. The trick is you alt and press null. Now we have a null. And I can use this null to move things around. And uh, there's one more thing that will help me uh, do this. I'm going to call this manual adjustment. And... Uh, the Can other you thing say I'm that again, please? Adjustment. <laughs> right. Manual adjustment. And uh, one thing that always helps is when you have some sort of object uh, in your scene that will allow you to, to find where that plus Y or plus X or plus Z is. We have this great little glass here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a cylinder. I'm going to make it, um, let's see... Always have a tape. So I would assume that the top of the glass, I mean, a beer glass, is around nine centimeters. So four and a half uh, centimeters is the the radius. And the height is, how much is a beer? It's like 15 centimeters high. We, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. One segment and six. Now, I'm going to make this editable. That's not a German uh, beer, uh, by the way. Sorry? That's not a German beer. That would be bigger. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> all Germans. I'm going to set it to the zero, zero, so it lies on there. I'm going to lock my Y and move it on the XZ plane, all right? Now, what you're seeing here is that it's too close to, to what we're doing, so I need to move it back to get the proper... Uh, this is one of the things with motion tracking that maybe you have to move things quite further back to make them smaller. So you can always go... Uh, and sort of move it back or move it front. Now, I don't know why my scale is botched that way. I don't care. I'm just going to leave this where I think my computer is. Now, remember this little one here, this null? This is this over here. So we have an indication. This is the front. These two are the front of my computer. So I can get my glass and, and put it there where I think 
it's going to be sort of close to there. And I'm going to make it, I guess, oops, undo scale. So smaller. Yep. My scene is out of whack because my camera is not correct. So let me put it manually. And you can see that it's not facing upwards. We, we do have a problem with the orientation if we want the table to be horizontal because we don't have enough uh, correct features to align it. So this is where the manual adjustment comes. By moving these rotations, I can align my glass so that it looks a bit more normal. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use this line here to align to the table so I get the parallel of the table. Then I need these lines here to run across the table. So you can see it's not this one, undo. It's this one here and this one here. Good. A bit more. And this is, uh, you know, you, you can always uh, just play around with these numbers. So I've got a parallel line here. I've got a parallel line here. I've got a parallel line here compared to the table. So now I need to bring this somewhere closer to me. And uh, one thing I did forget to do is remove the top because the beer won't fit in and make sure that the top lip is a bit larger or the bottom lip. And that's because I want to see something that's very similar to what I'm doing. And of course, if you want to grab your background, you go to the footage of the motion tracker. You say create background object and you drag this on this object. So we're projecting with a frontal projection on this so we can see through it what's going on. Don't forget to go here and in the viewport set this to no scaling to the maximum developers. No scaling. That's the proper way to do it. So now I want to find a, a, a situation where I have my lines parallel enough and the glass oriented. And this is, again, a an exercise in patience. But if you've done it uh, in enough times, you will do it. So this is pretty parallel with this. This is pretty parallel with this. These lines, OK, the table may be a bit crooked. Now, about the glass, don't worry. Just move it in the X, Z plane. And make it smaller. And now... You can see that it's not swimming. It's it's there. Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the mug, copy it, go here, paste it, put this where the oops. So zero out the coordinates. So right click, right click, and right click. Now we have a mug, and let's go and activate Redshift. Good. There's our little mug here. And what else do we need to do? And to, to close this off, I'm going to show you how to create a shadow catcher very, very, very uh, quickly. The plane uh, should be on the floor. The plane should be on the floor. Oh, my mug wasn't on the floor. So it wasn't. The, that's why I couldn't get the glass to work. So no problem. Put the floor where the mug is. You can get away as long as you don't have uh, slipping. You can do this. It does not matter. I'm going to put it here. And what we're going to do is right click on the object. This is for um, a redshift. And you go to the render, the, 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 the render tags, redshift object, and you go to mat and you say override, general, shadow catcher. And now my redshift, that's a layout I've made. Press play. Uh, good. Is this Redshift? It's Redshift. Uh, Redshift. Oh, yeah. Duh. See, when I'm in a hurry. Now we need a light. We don't have a, an, a, um, an environment. Background objects are not rendered by Redshift. So uh, the best way to do that is to create a dome light, which is in the lights, not the, um, the scene objects. Then we need to go right down here and turn off the background, enable the backplate, Load the same footage we have over here, and you can do this by copying and pasting this. Come on, copy, and then go to your dome light. You go here, you paste it, you press enter, then you open this up and you say animation, and then you say mode simple, and then you calculate and detect the frames, 
And what do I do? Is the backplate on? Or didn't it find the image? Reload image. All right, let's go and find the image. Turn it. Let's go and do that. It's not here. Computer in a room. Text this. Let's load this. And animation, reload image, timing frame, simple. I don't know why it's not detecting the frames. Why isn't it detecting the frames? What have I, what am I, did this a million billion times here? Dome light. Oh, environment. The. Uh, in terms of uh, the lightness, I wrote that somewhere. Oh, yeah, it's because we have OCIO enabled and uh, it's doing a conversion for this image. You will uh, uh, you'll be able to get rid of it. If you don't want any uh, color uh, correction, uh, just go to the advanced, go to the globals and set this to be uh, Rec 709 and sRGB and untone mapped. And this will go to the uh, proper uh, a color profile. So uh, I hadn't turned on the background environment or did I turn it on and then off anyhow. And uh, this now is a match moved scene. And that's Ooh. how simple it is. Of course, go and add an HDR because now it's all white. You find a, a dull room and uh, HDR and let's go here and find uh, someone's room, someone's bedroom. Uh, let's uh, drag this in here. Now we're going to get it. There you go. And then we can turn the exposure down and do all sorts of things. Then you render this with an alpha channel or a puzzle mat or something like that. Um, you can render the whole thing, then bring it in your comp. Use that alpha channel to extract this. So you can go and add depth of field. You can uh, export um, uh, a depth of field a depth map and all that just to make it align. Um, the, we can't render uh, ready composited uh, with the depth of field, unfortunately, because the um, camera uh, takes the image we have as a backplate and blurs it even more. So you have to do this in, in post. So a, a depth map will be ideal to, to do that in post and you can match it and, and so forth. And uh, let me see if I have anything else to say here. Uh, there, was, there was one question by, yep. uh, by Sandro. <laughs> My friend Sandro, I'm glad you're here. Um, so... Uh, let me see. His question was, uh, what uh, the thing about virtual keyframes? And um, the thing is that you can, well, in some situations, like if you have a, a pattern or a feature that you want to follow, but it's, for example, rotating, um, then you will get, you will exceed the error threshold quite uh, soon. And this means that you will lose the track or the tracker will lose track. Uh, with virtual keyframes, you can make it so that Cinema 4D is automatically setting a keyframe once you're exceeding a certain threshold so that you don't have to do that manually. In some cases, that works pretty well, but um, the, uh, the downside is that it's doing it manually. So uh, it's doing it automatically. So sometimes... Um, it's exceeding the error threshold. And then it's creating another virtual keyframe, but not in the very same place. So the more virtual keyframes you have, the more you are off the original pattern sometimes. Um, so this is something you always need to double check. Sometimes it works pretty well. Sometimes um, you need to do it manually instead because it's, uh, it's losing it. Um, and the purpose of a tracker is not to um, uh, to make the process as fast as possible, but to make the tracks as accurate as possible, uh, because um, a track is only good when nobody sees that it has been done at all. Um, so yeah, last, I want to close. So uh, light estimation, I've shown it before. I want to show it again because it's extremely easy. Load a light estimation for a an HDR, um, a, a 360 panorama, uh, not HDR. It could be HDR, but most of them are HDRs anyway. 
So just in case you didn't know, an HDR is not a 360 panorama. And a 360 panorama is not always HDR. Uh, they could be mutually exclusive. So this is an HDR and an, uh, th uh, 360 panorama. I've dropped it in a uh, dome light and I want to go and see where my light is coming from. Maybe I should have chosen something with actual sunshine because we want to find out where the sun is to create shadows. So the easiest way, create a camera, put it in the center of the world, view through it, Start revolving until you see where the sun is. If you can't see it because it's too bright, go and reduce the exposure until you see the sun, which is coming from there. Point to the sun. Let's assume the sun is over here. Using shift, go and add a, an infinite light. So it makes it a child, uh, not of the, of, the, uh, of the camera. I wanted to do that. And the camera anyway, put it under a camera, the camera, and make sure that the rotations and position, although the position doesn't make a difference, are aligned. And now just rotate the Z to point towards the camera. Undo. Let me do this again. Go here. There we go. 180 degrees. Done. That's it. Then you can use any camera from any point of view. And when I set this back to zero, I'm going to place something here. And if I add, uh, if this infinite light has shadows, I'm going to project shadows on the floor. So let's make a disk. Uh, let's move my camera up. Does the infinite light need to be a child of the camera? Because it isn't at the moment. Oh, no, no, no. That's it. The position now is where the sun is coming from. So it doesn't make a difference. Right. Make my sphere, let's say 20 and uh, lift it 10 from the ground um, or 20 from the ground. It's radius. Uh, I can move away over here. Let's bring up our uh, redshift. And uh, the shadows are coming from where the infinite uh, light is. Make your disk a uh, render tag object mat on, 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 and it catches the shadow coming from, I bet the sun is that way, and it is. So this is how you composite something. Of course, the, the shadow is not going to be like this. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, there that's, was another question here. Yep. How to reset with one click? Oh my God. Um, the reason, uh, the thing is, uh, just w when you hover over the numeric input field, uh, and you see those arrows, you just right click oh. the arrows and then, yeah. um, so if you right click default. here or right click here, right click, right click, right click, and it, it just uh, zeroes out the, the numbers. Oh, come on. Everyone knows that. Well, now everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, that's how you do light estimation for a scene. Um, and we're using the scene itself for lighting and the, um, uh, the actual distant uh, infinite light for the shadows. In this particular case, it doesn't look that good. There's one more thing, actually. You can select uh, a light and you can actually go to cameras and you can say select object as camera. Let me close this. Wait, so now can, we're looking through you, the light. Can you show that again? Because um, our faces were in the way. Our faces are in the way. I mean, that's not a bad thing. Come on. Uh, it's not, but so, people didn't see where you uh, click. When you select an object and you go to cameras and you say, use camera selected object, then we are actually viewing from the light. Look, I'm navigating my camera in my perspective, but I'm viewing the light. So you could use this method uh, when your light is in the center you can get rid of your disk and start just looking around until you find, what else do I have here? Oh yeah, I have the sphere, that's why. And so you don't have to make it a child. You can do this, uh, make sure that your exposure is down. So now I'm looking with my light, good. Now I can go back to my normal camera and all I have to do is take my light and reverse the Z. 180 degrees. So again, we're going to have the same beautiful result where the shadow is coming from the right, uh, from the correct uh, place. So let's turn this up to zero. And there you go.
And I bet you the sun is coming from that way. Yep. Good. As long as your object doesn't go into any weird places, you can place it wherever you want. But scale is a function of how close you are. So if I zoom in here, it appears that it's the sphere that's uh, growing. You just need to get around these um, uh, specifics because we always see that 360 from the point it was shot. There is no tree to go close to. This is an infinite sphere which we're just looking at. It doesn't matter how far we go. We're always going to see the same thing. It's only uh, the only thing that the camera position affects is how big something uh, looks like. And watch this. I'm not going to change the scale. Watch this. This is a large ball at the end of the field. I'm just going to move my camera up. Now this is a golf ball. I'm at the same distance. This is a huge ball. This is a golf ball. So this sort of optical illusion where this is standing will actually give you the sense of uh, scale. Don't make things bigger or smaller unless uh, absolutely necessary. All you have to do is move your object to where you want it to be. And if I go, if I put it somewhat even further away, it appears to be even bigger. Let's find, there you go. So watch this. The more I'm moving it I'm moving the camera down, the bigger the object seems, where in fact, it's, it's identical. Now stop the witchcraft. <laughs> huge sphere, golf ball. Huge sphere, golf ball. Huge thing in the sky. Um, yeah. Death star, death star. Look, look how big the moon is. No, it's a golf ball. No, it's the moon. No, it's a golf ball. So anyway, uh, <laughs> that's all I have to say for today hey ej is in the house what up hey what's up i'm done so yeah cool so um right so one thing i want to to add here i'm gonna share a few links here so there is a motion tracking cineversity series um recorded by the nose man himself here you go this is something you can watch um also um I created um, three, well, I did some webinars, three webinars about motion tracking. The first one is about automated tracking and you can find, you can find the link now in the chat. Then the next one is um, recreating that um, scene from the, uh, that I showed in the beginning with the, um, with the image frame and the guitars and amplifiers falling out. Yeah. You haven't you? You did the one with the dissolving world from from Free Man, didn't you? That was that free, had guy. free guy. Free oh, guy, yeah. Oh yeah, that. But that was. Um... You tracked it. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, yeah. See, sometimes yeah, but... I, I would have to watch it again to know what exactly I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jonas has made um, uh, a, a lot of extremely interesting uh, workflow uh, quick tips and tutorials. So just. Search on all the channels, right? Maxon, all of them. Band, Maxon training team, quick tips, everything. Cineversity, of course. Yeah. So let me go to this one. Let's see if my screen is there. Yeah, here we go. My screen is still working. Um, perfect. Um, let me do the housekeeping in the end, and then we're going to wrap up here. So. Uh, in case you came in late or you simply want to rewatch it, um, well, let me first show the um, Maxim Training Team YouTube channel here because that's where you can find what I just mentioned. Um, yeah, if you want to watch one of our uh, webinars or rewatch them, then this is the place to go. Um, all of our events, our, all of our upcoming events are listed here on the Maxon News events page. And here you can find all the cool webinars that we are doing, like Ask the Trainer, like Demystifying Post-Production, like Max on Color, VFX and Chill, also Motion Design Show is there. And um, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff that you can watch. Um, then again, this is, well, our Ask the Trainer sessions are currently based on this list of certification topics. You can find the certification website on under learn and certification and on here you find the list of certification topics it's this one and if you want us to um yeah to cover a specific topic just uh, get in touch and tell us and again 
um, I want to point this out in the very end. We want to give away uh, t-shirts to um, our lovely audience. Um, and this is where you can get them. Um, so let me just copy paste that link into the chat. Here we go. That's if I may say, if I may say for because uh, some people were worried, I will call back my mother. Thank you <laughs> for the reminder. Call, call back nose mom. <laughs> All right. So the um, the code again. Let me also post the code here that you need to type in. Right, so here we are, we are all set. You can now go to the Maxon merch store, uh, type in the coupon code, um, choose a t-shirt and only pay for the shipping. Isn't that great? Cool. Yeah, with all of this uh, being said, I think um, we had a lot of fun today and Indeed. we say goodbye. Hope to see you next time, guys. Bye-bye everyone. Bye everyone.